right, how's everybody doing tonight? Doing okay? I got the pin up on the board. If you did not get a chance to do the one on the overhead, I did put on. But I want to go and get started, though, if we could. Um, week 14, tonight we're going to cover, finish covering up uh, Linux distros for network security. This Thursday, this Thursday there will be no face-to-face -face class. Um, I could have another session of distros, but I'm like, eh. Let you guys work on your paper and research paper. Sound good? Get that out and get it out of the way. And so uh, this Thursday, no face-to-face. -face. Use that time to finish up your uh, research paper presentation. Five to seven pages on the paper, double space, single space if it's a quote or quotes. Ten minutes minimum. I will let go up to 15 minutes maximum. And presentation start next Tuesday and Thursday, letters A through N, next Tuesday, Thursday. If you do need to swap with somebody or you don't want to do it next week, just work around your neighbor there and find out what their last name is and see if you can swap with them. But as far as order of who goes when, just as long as you complete A through, if you're A through N, you complete uh, Tuesday, Thursday. Um, some students are like, I want to go first Tuesday, to get it out of the way. If you want to do that, that's fine. I do want everybody here, though, for the four sessions, because we'll be doing them for four sessions um, the next two weeks. The final session, uh, which is going to be actually two weeks from this Thursday, um, I'll be bringing pizza that night and then having you guys bring everything else, like pop or whatever you want to bring, desserts. I'll remind you that Tuesday prior. Uh, and you don't have to bring anything if you can't afford to bring anything. I know you're in college and some of you are barely afford to eat at home. So if you can't, don't feel bad. We'll have plenty of food here for everybody, so don't worry about it. Um, so that final Thursday, we'll have food here. Um, but do make sure you're here every session, even though you're not giving a presentation. I used to take uh, great people off, but I'm like, yeah, they're in college, not high school anymore. If you could just, you know, uh, you know, give those around you your presence, that would be helpful for them to have somebody in here to look at. Uh, or not, um, but <laughs> it is good to have people to look at, to at least act like they're interested in what you're saying. And so um, on the final session, after the last person gives their presentation, uh, we will do a tour of the IT lab. And I will first, we'll start out first off in the brain center, kind of where the monitoring is done. And uh, one of the students I've had, I had for a number of years here, actually works on Thursday, and she'll be uh, kind of giving you guys a grand tour of that area. And then I'll give you the tour of the voice over IP, all the servers, the backup tapes, um, and then we'll be finished with network security. I know uh, next semester has already started with signups. If you have any questions about courses uh, that I'm offering for the fall, let me know. Um, I know a number of them are already starting to fill up already. The iOS development course, is going to fill up pretty quick. If you're interested in that, um, let me know uh, or sign up quickly on that one. The other one that fills up quickly is the CIS180VB.net online course, Visual Basic online course. That fills up pretty quick. Uh, the other ones you're OK on if you, you know wait a few days or whatever. But those are the two I know will go pretty quick. Um, as far as after this class, I do recommend Cisco courses, Conley. Uh, which mo many of you know already. I try to give a plug right now for his courses and also Stephanie's courses. Any of their courses that they're offering for Cisco, I highly recommend uh, those courses. And so, you know, Stephanie's new to campus, so be nice to her. Uh, she's doing good, though. This is her first semester, but she's doing a great job, and it'll keep getting better and better. And so with new labs and new classes, that's the way it is. But uh, she's enjoyed it. and. Uh, so next semester, they're both offering the same courses that normally are offered. One of the newer ones that you might have heard of is a virtualization course that's brand new this semester. So by next semester, those of you that went through this semester know people that have, um, kind of like the iOS students I have, you know, they're kind of like the guinea pigs the first semester. They get all the raw end of the deal. Uh, that, you know, but they, you know, they've enjoyed it, but, you know. It's the first semester, so second semesters are always better, subsequent semesters. So uh, anyway, the virtualization courses, I've heard pretty good curriculum on that, and it'll be all hammered out by, by the uh, fall for sure. 
And so if you have any questions at all about uh, courses, let me know. I can, even if it's not one of my courses, I can maybe answer any questions you might have about the course. Um, if it has to do with a CIS, PCT degree, or even web. Um, oh, the other web one I did want to mention that uh, it doesn't usually fill up this quickly, uh, but the Web 290, it's actually Web 235 or something this time. It's officially a, an, an official name now uh, for a PHP course, PHP development. It's going to be meeting a one night, I think it's a one night, Wednesday night, again this next semester, and it's on PHP, and it's actually filling up pretty quick. So if you're interested in that, probably sign up for that early, be good. And that's a four credit hour. The VB.net's a four credit hour, that's CIS 180. Um, and then the iOS course, it's a four credit hour as well for development. So that's my little spill on the fall semester. Any questions on your paper or presentation? I do want to recommend or, or help you a little bit with the transition from paper to presentation. Your presentation will be based on your paper, but not verbatim. So I think I mentioned this a few weeks back in the podcast that I put out there, which is you want to make sure you have um, the outline basically is covered in your presentation, but it doesn't have to be 100% of the outline. It's things that you really find of interest in your research paper, that's what you're going to bring out in the, in the presentation. If there's items you couldn't put in your research paper, put them in your presentation. That's fine, too. You can, it doesn't have to be in your paper to be in the presentation, if that makes sense. And so um, and that's actually good. Sometimes you can, like, for instance, videos. You can't put that in the paper. I mean, you can reference it, but you can't put it in the paper. Those you can put in a presentation. Um, and most of your topics, well, you could probably find one good 30-second minute video to highlight whatever it is that you're talking about. Whether it's something you do yourself and you record it, uh, which I've had students do, or you find it on YouTube. Um, the only thing I'd recommend is if you do find something on YouTube, make sure and download it to your local computer. If you have Firefox, I recommend uh, looking for a plug-in for YouTube to where you can download that YouTube um, video. There is, I believe, in the course documents, a link to downloading YouTube videos as an actual MP4 video file. Because with our internet connection, it's going to be choppy. It's not going to work too great. So it's better to have it natively down. Not just here, but anytime you give a presentation with a video in it, it's always best to have it embedded in the presentation. Let's talk about um, what you're giving your presentation on. What platform? OK, so you've got uh, Microsoft Office. You've got OpenOffice. There's other ones out there as well. If there's anyone you think I don't have a, a version of, see me before you leave tonight. That way I can get installed on my Mac. If you wanted to present um, on your computer, so if you're doing a demo, which sometimes students want to do, let me know before you leave tonight as well. So I'll just kind of be able to work that in. If you're going to have handouts, um, also uh, let me know before you leave. A handout, I always tell students, if it's something that is really useful, an example would be, say you're doing on um, well, setting up Wi-Fi security. Three easy steps to set up Wi-Fi security. And in the handout has those three easy steps, step by step how to do it. That might be something beneficial for students to hold on to. Um, and so something that you know they could use after the class is, is a great handout. And so if it's just informational things or links, probably not so. But if it's a guide or a chart, definitely don't feel bad about saying, hey, I'd like to have this as a handout. It would add to your presentation probably and uh, give something to hold on to when people leave. Another idea, too, is, and students have never bid on this one, but maybe one of these years you will, uh, there is the option of recording your entire presentation prior to coming to class, videoing your voice with a slideshow, possibly, just like when you hear me on a podcast. So you could do that at home, um, record it, save it. You come in, I introduce yourself, we start playing it, you sit down. At the end of it, is there any questions? That's an option, and you can do it if you want to. Uh, a website I will show you that, that you can easily create a, up to a 15-minute video screencast uh, for no cost. It's the one I use, Screencast-O-Matic. It's like $20 a year if you want to buy it, but you guys don't need to. It's going to Screencast-O-Matic.com. It'll let you take a recording of your screen, Mac, PC, Linux, 
and save it as a video, a native video. So that's an option. You can also embed real videos, like say you're taking a video of something. You can embed videos. It has editing options in there where you can embed videos in there as well. So that is an option if you're kind of not wanting to stand up here or you're wanting to maybe do something a little different, that would be different, okay? And so that's an option for you. Um, any questions on your paper or presentation? 10 minutes minimum, 15 minutes max. In week 15, there's some multiple examples of final presentations, what they should look like or what they could look like, uh, past students' examples. And I know some of you are doing topics, um, duplicate topics, don't worry about it. You will, you'll probably touch base on some things that are the same, but for the most part, over the uh, 14 years I've been teaching this, uh, every student, even though they have the same topic, is going to teach a little bit different each time. So don't worry about that. Okay. So we're going to finish up on that network distros. Remember Thursday, jot it on your calendar if you haven't already. No face-to-face. -face, finish up your research paper presentations. And A through N next Tuesday, Thursday. Okay. A um, couple of the links here that I want to mention. I mentioned a few, a couple of, one of these I know multiple times this semester already, but spiceworks.com is one I definitely want to recommend. Just things that you should jot down if you haven't already this semester. The website where you can go in and uh, it'll inventory your, your network, has travel ticketing built into it, support built into it. BarracudaNetworks.com uh, you don't have to write the whole URL out there, but basically you want to go to the support area where you can submit uh, things that are bad, meaning both of these websites you can go and say, this software is terrible or this hardware is not so great, and this is why. And the reason you'd want to post in these areas is because other network admins will look at those frequently and determine whether or not they want to buy something. So you might be like, well, people don't really read those. They really do. People do read them. And so if you do have a bad experience with the hardware, software, service of any type, you can post it to one of these two sites or both, and they'll get in the hands of maybe somebody that where you might save them some headaches down the road. And then vice versa, you can go on these sites and save you some headaches as well. Um, and so it's just kind of like a movie review, but you're doing it on product and you're doing it on procedures or, or not procedures, product, software, hardware, things of that nature. So I want you to be start thinking of that. If you haven't already thought of that and you haven't started doing that already, it might feel kind of uneasy for you to do it the first time. And you're really not trying to slam a company or slam a hardware, but you do want to get the word out just like any, any group would do. If there's bad product or bad service, you want to make sure people know about it. Um, and it usually straightens the company up too and it helps them in the long run. They might not know about it. Or they're ignoring it and this stops them from ignoring it. Uh, other distros that we did not go over, these are just a few of them here. Um, Black Buntu is a distro that actually focuses on a more of a hacking side of, of uh, distribution for Linux. Um, PWN IE Express, this one's actually a downloadable kind of Windows based Linux based uh, OS. Because a lot of these um, softwares that you're looking at here, even Ubertooth, has a built in OS where you can basically download it and run it from a Windows environment. You don't need a virtual environment to run it. It, it runs actually as an executable. It'll start up on, on a Windows machine. And so, you know, it's something to play with, something to look at over the summer when you have nothing to do for a couple days. You can play with uh, Linux. Now, just warning though, when you do start playing with Linux, you will get pretty excited, some of you, because there is some pretty cool stuff out there when it comes to anything you're interested in, whether it be gaming, media, uh, video, uh, you know, there are cool distros out there that focus on unique, uh, unique likeness that people like. And so just be aware of that. You might say, oh, I'm going to spend a day or two, be a week or two. Then backtrack, we've already went over that. Uh, the distro I gave you on the backtrack for the DVD, 
um, was the virtual distro that you could uh, run off of a uh, computer. You needed to have the uh, uh, virtual environment as well and to run it. And so we did not use uh, Windows Media, I mean Windows Virtual PC. What was that I used on that one? Uh, what's the other one? I'm sorry. Not, not Virtual PC. Um, you guys have never. Thank you. VMware is what I use. The VMware is the actual drive for this distro. It's a VMware download uh, along with the VMware executable is in the root of that DVD I gave you guys a few weeks back to install. And um, VMware for this distro works really well. It's one of the best well-known distros. Uh, VMware is actually be becoming a well-known distro for uh, doing virtual with uh, Linux and even Windows. Some of you have already familiar with VMware, some of you aren't. It's probably well worth your time to play with it over the summer. And there's the, uh, lin the link for Backtrack. One of the things I wanted to mention was, like a lot of these distros, you can install these distributions on thumb drives, and the websites will generally have a step-by-step -step how to do it. Uh, you format your drive, you have, download the ISO, you usually have a little executable that uh, builds it onto your ISO, and then from that point on, you can boot it from your USB drive. Now, with the advent of USB 3.0, it, it screams pretty fast. It goes pretty quick. I don't know if you've used any 3.0 yet. Devices, true 3.0 devices, much faster than 2.0 when it comes to speed. Anybody use any 3.0 stuff yet? Okay. Do you, you're vi used for video, I'm guessing. What's the difference you've seen with 2.0 to 3.0? Um, well, if, if you look at the specs bandwidth, it's double going to USB 3.0, but uh, real world, I would say it's Okay, so significant difference then. Oh yeah. Okay, very, cool. Very so if you've never played with that, uh, with thumb, thumb drive installs with OSs, it's definitely something to play with over the summer, and you can uh, get a distro up and going, running on a USB drive. Uh, this side here is just a screenshot of uh, Backtrack Linux org, and I actually highlight one of the articles here, something, you know, I told you about pe people posting things uh, or tricks or tips or stay away from this. This post is about social engineering toolkit, creating, creating fake websites to your own box. Talks about the, this guy did a little write up on a Java applet that's out that attacks social engineering. A Java applet attack in social engineering to toolkit, use it to clone a website and trick a target into visiting it shows you in this tutorial how it's done, how hackers use it, and then ways to thwart against it from happening. And so it's a pretty cool tutorial on, um, and there's a number of them on this site as well for Backtrack. STD Nopix, uh, the, the distro that has on it the, uh, actually Cisco started this years ago. It's again a live distro. I've used it in this class before. Uh, there's a website. And it's got about 1,800 apps on it, and about 800 of them are devoted toward network security. And on the website, it actually has a good description of each one of them and how to use them with, along with tutorials. And this one you can also run off a uh, USB drive. And it's only a 600 meg download, I believe. That one is 600 meg ISO. Um, it's meant for the novice and professional both. Uh, it was developed by a network security person. If you're completely new to Linux, I would suggest starting with this versus Backtrack. Okay, Backtrack's going to overwhelm a lot of you, but this one's just enough out of the box to where you can actually start playing with it and getting used to the Linux environment and some of the tools available in network security, and then upgrade to Backtrack afterwards. That's what I recommend doing. Okay, and again, it's free to download. About 600 megs for an ISO and they have to burn that to DVD and play with it. Katana, this one's actually pretty cool. This one actually does run on a USB drive. It's portable. And I think I've mentioned in here, um, portableapps.com. This is kind of a network security portableapps.com. It has on it nothing but network security tools, and it runs off a flash drive. It's built, if I'm not mistaken, off of the portableapps.com environment. 
It's built on top of it that gives you a nice little menu when you plug your USB drive in where you can run apps, you can install apps. It's basically having your own start menu on any computer because you just plug it in and you've got apps out there for you. But it's got everything from penetration testing, auditing, forensics, system recovery, network analysis, malware removal. It also has over 100 portable Windows apps such as Wireshark, Metasploit, Nmap, Cane Enable, which you've heard of all those already. And so, great app to have. It's pretty much got everything in the kitchen sink in it. I believe it's a fairly good size download. Uh, the last time I downloaded it, it was about four gigs in size. And so they keep adding to it. I think they have a minimal version. So if you wanted to start with that and work your way up, but most of you have eight gig drives, I'm guessing, or eight gig USB drives anyway, two or three of them hanging around. I'd play with this one as well. You'll really like it because everything in it's portable. And it does allow you to install other portable apps. And if you're a developer of any type, if you're, you're going to go into Windows development, it shows you how to create um, apps to be portable on this drive or to launch apps to be portable. And so definitely recommend that one. Um, hack from a cave.com. Love the website. Uh, Katana is the website for that. And then the other ones, they mirrored. Uh, edu site which is a long one but the first one you can remember hack from a cave.com everybody can remember that one you don't even have to jot it down hopefully you remember that um, then katana lets you do a usb install boot or does a usb install boot runs windows uh, windows can be run and then it's about a four gig download which i already mentioned so it runs from a windows a windows environment you don't have to restart your machine then Network Security Toolkit, NST, it's a Fedora-based CD, loads again, tons of network security software. The main aim of this one is to provide network admins a complete set of open source tools. Uh, one of the cool things I do like about this one is the last sentence, I believe, where it talks about, it focuses a lot, you've heard of Wireshark, but there's a lot of other apps out there like Wireshark. This one has a lot of those apps in this distro uh, to play with. And um, ones that are actually real easy to use, like GUI based, and then they have some command prompt based, which I know some of you are into that command prompt and you want to maybe learn more. This distro will be for you because you can do a lot of behind the scenes um, queries with command prompt. And one of the benefits of command prompt is uh, system resources. System resources with command prompt apps are much less intensive than GUI based apps. It could be do, both do the same exact thing. But your GUI based apps, if you're familiar with anything about development of applications, every time you hit an object in a, in a Windows based app, it adds memory to your system or takes memory from your system each time. So say it's like just a button or something or a picture. Well, maybe each time you hit that button or that picture is hitting, it might take like four megs of memory every time okay on some of these apps and so if it's a command based app it takes a lot, it's a lot less intensive system uh, memory usage and easier to use because I think in the Linux in the Linux distro they really focus a lot on command prompt environments back when I first started computer programming and network security everything was command prompt because we didn't even have a mouse to play with and so it kind of makes how old I am uh, but you know, command prompts is still around though, and I know some of you still use it. It's not going away anytime soon. The start run command is going to be here for a while, and um, it's much quicker when you learn command prompts. And for instance, an example would be uh, just learning command prompts on how to navigate structures of files in your computer, knowing how to get to certain folders or get into certain files, just using command prompt. That's well worth your time to learn how to do that. Because there is times where you'll try to boot up into a server, you won't be able to boot up into it, but you can get to a command prompt. And by knowing the CD commands for command prompts for navigation structure on a file menu, uh, it'll save you a lot of time, a lot of headaches. So NetworkSecurityToolkit.org for that one. That's a screenshot of that one. It's not a real fancy uh, screen like most of these Linux distros are pretty basic. 
They do all have, though, if you're into any type of games, network security admins and network security administrators are into games, by the way. And so you see a lot of games on these distros that you won't see maybe on Windows distributions. You know, because Windows has what? You have what? Hearts, Minesweep, is that right? Minesweep and, and Hearts? What else do we have on it now? I don't even know. What is it? Solitaire. Solitaire. Maybe a more cooler version of Solitaire or something. The 3D version. I don't know. Um, but they have some games on there to waste time if you want. Uh, Pen2 is the other one. This is a live CD uh, and a live USB. Both. It's built upon Gentoo, 32 and 64 bit both. Some of you have 64 bit clients already. Um, its feature on this is built mainly on Wi Fi tools. So, Wi Fi injection, Wi Fi hacking, uh, Wi Fi penetration testing. Um, so, if you're wanting to go into Wi Fi testing and Wi Fi environment for penetrate your network, this would be the one to get. Pen2.ch. That's the screen on this one. And one of the cool apps on this one, I can't, you can barely see it on this one, but it's the Ethereal, the Ethereal app here. The Ethereal app is pretty cool. That one is a lot, it's a GUI interface. Um, it's a GUI interface, uh, graphical interface that shows you network traffic as it's happening uh, using Ethereal. And Ethereal actually is what Wireshark was called prior to becoming Wireshark, was Ethereal. The other one you'll see in a Linux that you'll need to watch for if you play with it over the summer is EtherApe, EtherApe, A-P-E, E-T-E-H, E-T-H-E-R, Ape is another GUI interface graphical environment. And what it does basically is whenever you're playing with it, um, it's, it runs and it looks like a kind of like a, a weather map kind of thing. And then you see dots, and then these dots actually are IPs on your network. And when one of these IPs spike on a download, you'll actually see a spiral red blotch hit it. That way you know there's some major activity on those. And so if one goes down, you can change a color code to go some, say, you know, um, I don't know, blue. So maybe change it from black to blue. You know, if it's blue, that IP address is going down. The pink, because it pings it every few milliseconds. And if it's going down, more than likely there's needs attention of some type. Or if, it's, if the ping's taking too long, needs some attention. Then lastly, Helix. Helix is a Ubuntu live CD, and by the way, this whole presentation will be is already on a PDF in this week's folder. Uh, but Helix is an Ubuntu-based CD, specially designed for system analysis, data recovery, security auditing, and an incident response. It runs in two modes, a Linux mode and a Windows mode. The Windows mode is what's cool about this one. This one runs inside a Windows operating system. You don't have to do a... Um, a parallel install, like a dual boot, you do not have to do a parallel with virtual. It runs within the operating system. It takes about 10 minutes to set it up once you download Helix and you follow the instructions and you're up and going running uh, Linux within a Windows environment. It's literally a shortcut on your desktop like any other app, but it runs uh, Linux within that application environment, within the OS environment. That's a really cool one. You will not find these I just mentioned tonight, the reason I mention these, every I can try to add new ones. I think I mentioned to you if you wanted to play with Linux to go like Barnes and Noble and get a Linux mag, which some of you might have gotten already. I mean, has anybody done that? Went to Barnes and Noble? Okay, everybody, no one's done it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you don't have to because the ones I mentioned in here tonight, um, you can look at this PDF later. These are the ones you really want to play with. These are like the top of the heap, top of the you know the main crop of what network admins use every day especially the ones that are, you know, USB driven um, because, you know, none of us have, um, you know, we're all busy in our jobs and to have something to be able to run off of USB easily is the way to go. And then number two, the distros that are actually running from an OS uh, shortcut on, a, on an OS and running as an application, but it's actually launching a whole other OS within that environment uh, is a real 
cool thing, I think, as well as come out in the last couple of years. And so um, all of these apps, all these OS I recommend tonight is the ones I recommend you investigating over the summer months. You will find out of investigating all of these that you'll probably, you know, lean towards one that you really like the most and then just keep it with you all the time, okay? And granted, on most of these, you'll probably use 5% of the apps that are on there. The other 95% you'll never use uh, if you're like me, but it's nice to know they're on there if you need them. And so, um, you know, if you have to have, like, say, for instance, uh, I don't know, recovering um, a hard disk from uh, failure or transferring data, I don't really use these tools much to do that, but I have in the past had to do it and I had that on my USB drive and ready to go. And so it's nice to have it on a USB drive because back in the day we would carry our CD cases, which I've given you guys CDs and DVDs this semester. But most tools are being uh, migrated to a USB environment, which makes, especially with 3.0 coming in and it's so cheap on buying USB drives, it's you know crazy not to do it anyway. Um, and it's portable and so it doesn't take up a lot of room. So I can have you know tons of apps on my USB drive and whole operating systems, whereas before I'd have to have you know, a thick you know, CD case or DVD case, and I still have those, but what I carry around every day is my USB drive with the apps that I use. I leave my DVDs and CDs at home for the most part, even though I still have them. But uh, most students, when they're starting out today, like you guys, you're going to build probably a bigger library of USB-driven uh, apps than what I have when I started. And that's normal because that's the environment that everybody works in. In fact, a lot of your computers you buy today, laptops, desktops, what do they not have even? What do they, don't even, what do they, what do they not have in these devices now that you used to have five years ago? Floppy drive. <laughs> Floppy drive, thank you. What else? <laughs> yeah, DVD drives, CD drives, you know, they don't even have them. Because somebody was complaining the other day about, they're like, I want to well, they're gonna buy a new laptop, a network app in front of mine. And he goes, um, yeah, I couldn't buy one with a DVD drive or a CD drive. I said, when's the last time you even used one? He goes, oh, I use them all the time. I'm like, okay, well, no, when's the last time you used one? He said, um, about nine months ago. He used one for something. I'm like, okay, you can just get an external, <laughs> get an external DVD drive, right? And, you know, you don't have to worry about you know, the bulkiness of having a DVD component in your, and plus it can fail. And so, you know, buy an external for 100 bucks, done. You can use it for any, any computer you're at. Because in the server environment, DVDs and CDs have not been in server hardware for probably four to five years. They're just not in them. If you wanted to install something, you have to plug in an external uh, DVD. Firewires, what it usually came out with initially, then it went to 2.0, now 3.0 is out, it's going to be much faster. Um, but yeah, it's been in, in a network operating systems, NASA's have not had um, DVD CDs on them for years. And consumers are just now catching up because consumers, for the most part, people listen to music where? Where do they listen to music at? Where is it stored at? For the most part, today. Yeah, but where's the actual music stored, right? Is it on the hard disk? It's on here. Like, what's some and what's some uh, popular music <coughs> repositories people use? Pandora. That's a big one, right? Even cars have them, right? Pandora is a big one. What's some other big ones that are out there? You know, there's there's Facebook has one integrated into it. I believe I can't remember the name of it. It's a guy here actually started Napster that owns it. But there's tons of cloud-based. Mu that's where most people listen to music day is from the cloud. Okay, if they want to buy a song, they'll buy it, but most likely they won't. Uh, but, you know, most people don't, I mean, how many of you, uh, you know, there might be a few of you in here that have MP3 collections at home on, on a hard drive, maybe on iTunes or whatever the case may be. But most people today, when they want music uh, or listen, when they listen to music just daily or even movies, it's all streamed. It's all stream. You can even buy stream content of music to where you pay so much a month, you can listen to whatever you want to. You don't have to buy. You don't have to buy it per se. You just listen to the service, and you can listen to the song and add add bass or whatever. Um, the reason I say that is, DVDs, CDs. Not that they 
will ever go away totally, but you know, a lot of computers actually are now setting up the OS as to where they actually are restored via online. They're not restored via DVD like they used to be. Um, Apple started that a couple years ago with their server OS and now it went to their client OS to do that. Windows is doing that now as well. Dell does that, Gateway does that. To where when a computer crashes, you just hook it up to Ethernet, hardware, hardwire somewhere, it can go in and do a total restore with an Ethernet connection that has internet connection and you know, you're good to go. And so everything from, and that's a pretty good size download, right? But most of you guys at home have plenty enough speed to download a 600 meg or even a four gig file within a pretty short period of time. Um, and so, again, I'm not saying that CDs and DVDs are going by the wayside, but in a way they are. And I would probably say in 20 years, they'll kind of be like eight tracks <laughs> are to me and cassettes are to my generation. Because uh, my generation, that's when CDs came about and DVDs came about. And my brother and my parents, eight track and cassette. Okay, and you you know, be hard pressed to even find eight tracks and cassettes anymore, maybe an antique store somewhere. Um, but you know, today most people use digital media is used in the cloud and, and bought in the cloud. Same thing with networking. Whole server OSs are built in the cloud and companies buy the entire OS and log into it, manage it, and work from it from a cloud server somewhere in California or something. And so my son works for a company and they have four locations in the US. They all log into a server in Georgia. And the servers in Georgia host their voice over IP, their data, connectivity, everything. Okay? And so that's where you guys are walking into leaving this class. That's the jobs you're walking into is jobs that are either already there or they're going there when it comes to cloud technology, uh, network technology. And so these tools will still be in use, but more so probably for USB components than CDs or DVDs. Okay, so if I, was, if I was you, I would play with all of these that I mentioned tonight. Uh, the, the distros, look at each distro and how to install it on a USB drive. And um, play with that, find out which ones you like, keep it with you all the time, know how to use it, and you're ready. So any questions on Linux distros or network security distros at all, or maybe some that you've played with that we didn't go over? This semester okay so I do highly recommend I know you guys are busy right now but in the summer months hopefully you'll have a, a little lag time to where you can play with Linux um, and be able to maybe set up a few distros and be able to start playing with them maybe you have an old computer at home that you don't use that's just sitting in a corner you can load Linux on that and start playing with it and so that's that's definitely how I started years ago uh, and then, then built from there, that knowledge base. And so uh, network security admins are always going to use Linux for, like we use this semester, for penetration testing. Uh, also use it for um, websites. The number one, number one distribution for website development still is a Linux backend. And so uh, hopefully this will help you kind of give you a kind of a head start in the Linux distribution. This Thursday, no class, no face-to-face -face class. Work on your paper, work on your final presentation. If you have any questions on either one before you leave, let me know. Also, if you have any questions on uh, uh, handout, or if some of you might want to do the video option, which I'd love one of my students to grab onto one of these years. I always have students go, yeah, I think I'm gonna try to do that, and they never do it. And so, but I think it'd be kind of cool to do it. I've had students do like half of the presentation that way, but kind of do the whole thing that way, uh, be kind of cool, maybe. And so if you want to do that and you need help on it, let me know before you leave, I'll help you with it. Otherwise, we are done tonight, and I will see everybody next Tuesday. Who is going to present next Tuesday? Just raise a show of hands. Who wants to get it out of the way next Tuesday, last time they threw in? Just need about two or three of you, maybe. Okay, one, two more, two more. Two more on Tuesday. We got one, two more, come on. Two in, one in the back. Anybody else? Okay, so you two are going on Tuesday, right? Yes. Cool. All right, let's, sounds good. Do I now? I'm going to try this.
Are you going to try? Okay. So maybe three. Maybe three. That's all he needs.